place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord. let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness and holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence It's your breath 
in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you Only it's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you Great are you, Lord Great are you, Shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you Lord? It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you Good morning, church. Good morning, City Hill. Great to have you with us again this Sunday morning. Um, it's just opening prayer before we, before we actually get into the Word. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you that you are with us, even as we sit at home, even as we sit somewhere around the world watching. Your Holy Spirit is moving in our midst, and we thank you for the opportunity of your Word. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, everyone, it's good to be with you again. It's absolutely great to, to see that uh, things are happening online and, you know, we're actually having a very good response and being able to touch and impact people's lives and connect with each other even during these times. And it's really important for us to do that as, as a Christian community because uh, fellowship with each other is, is a vital part of, of what makes being uh, part of the church what it is this morning um i actually want to do a slight follow-on to a mini series that tim did uh two weeks ago he ended two weeks ago he did a, a mini series on being free and he he took us through some awesome um some awesome aspects and realities of what it means to be free and what Jesus has done through the freedom he has given us. So this morning, there's a little bit of an add-on to it um, that I felt uh, prompted by, by God to actually bring. And it's hard to be about being free, but breaking free from personal sin. And uh, many, you know, many, many people, many Christians who have committed themselves to Christianity and, and live uh, sa uh, uh, saved lives, 
still find that every now and again they battle with personal issues of sin and personal things that come up and, and they, they're in this like constant war. And we're going to get into that a little bit this morning, which is, which is going to be good. I believe that if we just open our hearts and, and open our ears to what, to what God is saying and what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through us, that I'm trusting we will get some, some handles on this and we'll be able to, to pick it up and, and take it to the next level. Um, for, as, I, as I was saying, many of us, and I'm speaking, I'm saying this as a man who has personal sin uh, that I war against constantly. And I count myself fortunate because I'm in the same league as the Apostle Paul, who himself in Romans uh, 5 and 6 spoke about the issues of personal sin. And so I think it's not an uncommon thing. For man, in fact, the Bible is clear that man, uh, the carnal man, is actually a very sinful uh, uh, individual, human. But that through Jesus Christ, he gives us the capacity to move out of that, that control, that slavery to sin and into righteousness. So this morning, we're just going to talk about that a bit. Um, as we go through some of the stuff. Um, on the last preach, on the closing preach that Tim did regarding being free, he spoke about the armor of God, which is absolutely um, a fundamental aspect to being Christian, is to understand in the aspects, first of all, that our war is not against physical people, against physical beings, but against spiritual realms and, and principalities and, and wickedness in high places. And he speaks about the armor of God. Um, the, the, one of the biggest battles that I think, that I believe, that I see in myself, we have to, we have to war against, is actually one that takes place in ourselves. One where our, our recreated spirit, our reborn man, wars against the carnal uh, human who has come up and lived under sin um, continuously. And you have these two dynamic forces, these two dynamic, uh, 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 what is the word I'm looking for, these two dynamic aspects to life actually warring against each other. And Paul, as I said before, actually speaks quite significantly about this. I want to start this morning, and, and maybe you can join, turn there, or it will be up. You can read from there in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 13. And I'll just read through it quickly. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with your belt of truth around your waist, your breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the, from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, the helmet of take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if you have a look at the Ephesians six, um, we have been truly blessed with the absolute best weaponry that there is for the task that we're called and that we need to face, and that is a spiritual battle. We, the weaponry that God has provided us in Jesus through Jesus, is outstanding will overcome. In fact, the Bible talks about it being able to tear down strongholds. It, it is it, the word of Jesus, where he's, he's, his word is a double-edged sword. Um, we have the best available resource to us that we need to win this war. So why is it? And I, I noticed this around uh, in various situations. Why is it that so many Christians, Christians or believers 
And we are true believers. Um, are either wounded in an area or feel defeated or, or, or despondent um, with certain things. I want to give you this, and this is what God gave to me four o'clock one morning in the last week. Because the best, all the best weapons um, you can get lack one thing. They require one thing. They don't lack anything. They require one thing to make them effective. And that is the strength and the determination of the soldier that is wearing them. Can you, can you say amen to that? If you just let your mind just think about that for a moment. We have given us, we have been given to us the best there is to tackle the spiritual wars that we will face. All of that weaponry, all of that protection is useless if the soldier himself is not strong and not determined. And it would be the same uh, that we would find in any situation of military organizations. Um, you can have the best nuclear armament. Uh, it's useless if the person who's guiding it and pushing the buttons is not determined to make it work and, and decides not to push it or whatever the case would be. I use that as an example. Maybe not a good one. A tank is useless. It might be able to destroy buildings and whatever the case may be. It's useless if there's no determination or strength of the person inside of it making the decisions to actually fight the fight. A battleship, one of the biggest inventions in terms of capacity in warfare, is useless if the soldiers on board are not determined. Um, and, and are not strong and absolutely focused on what their, their purpose is. And so, to, so it comes to the point that in, in the whole uh, Christian reality, the Christian life, the Christian existence while we're on earth and looking at the armor of God that has provided us, the weakness of the soldier is the soldier or alternatively the strength of the soldier is the strength of the soldier I, I, I'm hoping that that makes sense as we just let it soak in uh, so our war as as people is one that exists between our human nature and our recreated spirit we're going to look at a couple of scriptures um, that Paul actually goes and, and does teachings on. And as I, say, as I start, said when I, when I opened up, Paul is not a man who was, first of all, unlearned or unschooled. He was very schooled, very well educated. And reading his letters to the churches, he was also very, um, very uh, vulnerable very open about his experiences. And I think we have a lot to learn about personal sin and overcoming personal sin and the reasons to overcome sin personally. Our personal sin um, is, is found in, in the wisdom that Paul actually shares with us. I'm going to turn to Romans 7 verse 21. So I find this law at work. Although, and maybe you can, I can certainly relate to what Paul is going to describe now. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind or my heart and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will, res excuse me, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Th 
thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I in myself and in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, am a slave to the law of sin. What a deep uh, understanding. What a revelation that, that Paul gives us in his own experience. And, and I think that if we, we were just to reflect on those words ourselves, I think we more often than not can, can relate to what he's actually getting at here. For we find ourselves doing the things we don't want to and not doing the things that we want to do. <laughs> what a conflict. What an internal struggle this war is within man. The war of the, of the recreated man, saved by Jesus Christ, and the carnal flesh, which is constantly a tussle and struggle. You know, even in the context of the modern world, in, in the world around us, I mean, I've, I've sat in boardrooms and you'll hear about the good dog and the bad dog. I mean, where does that concept come from? It seems that within each and every human, there is an understanding that there is an, an evil aspect to us or a sinful, a sinful aspect to, what we, to us and an aspect that is inclined towards God, even if we don't know God, within the core of us, as a, as a, spe as a, as a, as a species, as a, as a creation, we know that we have a creator. And we're, in, we're, we're created in God's image. And I think that we, have, we lean towards that. Um, people will also talk about clear conscience, you know, doing something with a clear, I'm not talking, I'm talking outside of Christianity, doing something with a clear conscience or, well, where does that come from? Well, that comes from the presence of God in his creation. And I think that is permanently with us. What Jesus does for us is he breaks and destroys the legitimate hold of the law of sin, uh, uh, the law of sin over us we are we are saved we are we are released we are set free by the price he paid and i think that uh, the depth of that is is revealed over time to us as we experience um, the moving from glory it's also paul that says as we move from glory to glory to glory as the Spirit of God just grows, grows us, matures us. So having a look at this top, at this uh, Romans reading that we just read, Romans 7, uh, 21. So what is Paul saying? Does Paul say we, we can't win the war? And his own words were, his own words are by no means. By, in, by no means does he mean that. We can win this war. We must win this war. How do we win this war? Through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to get into what we need to do, what we need to embrace as followers and believers and submitted lives to the King of Kings for what he, in response to what he has done for us. If we go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, uh, Paul again, he says, this is, this is how we overcome the flesh as well as any other things of the world that would come against our spirit, our, our recreated selves in Christ. This is what he says. <clears throat> we demolish arguments and every present... Uh, Pretension. We demolish arguments and every pretension, I only said presentation, pretension, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient 
to Christ. There, that is how we overcome personal sin in our lives. I've, I've searched, and in my experience and in my life, and the things that I've been through, this is the only conclu- solid evidence or solid, solid comment that I have in terms of this war. Yes, we have grace. We have grace from God. Not grace to continue to live a sinful life, but to pursue His righteousness. To move from glory to glory. Understanding that we are carnal and that we are by nature sinful beings. And that Jesus has paid the price for every single sin. But that doesn't mean we... we we stay in that place, understanding that we're covered by grace and that we cannot and will not overcome sin, so we'll live with it. It is not acceptable to our God. That isn't what he wants from us. So Paul says, this is how you win this war. I'm going to read it again. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ during my preparations for this preach this morning I, I read a couple of commentaries and, and one of them stood out to me commentaries on on this particular scripture one of them that really stood out to me says this Paul says that we take every thought captive and subject all thinking to Jesus Christ. Now, in my mind's eye, if I have a thought which I am unclear on or is marginal or is not, is something that, that I cannot put a hand on or, or, take, or get, a, get a, an, upper, an upper arm over, I take that thought and I subject it to Jesus Christ. And I say, Lord, Here is this thought. I'm bringing it as a captive to you. And I I need you to speak into my life, into my situation, into me. Give me revelation. Give me strength. Empower me. Help me right now. I'm submitting and subjecting this thought to you. That's part of the process of taking captive. Taking something and giving it to Jesus. If we're not sure, not saying, well, I'm actually not sure. I'm going with it now. And I've got grace covering me. So I should be good with it. Any thought, whether, whether, whatever it may be, taking it captive, subjecting it to Jesus Christ, and he works it out. He, 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 makes, he makes whatever it is sub, uh, subject to his authority and his name. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that strong? Isn't that how powerful our Lord is? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I thought that was just such an amazing thing. Now, this leads, us on to, leads me on to the next, the next part of, of what I want to say this morning. If we understand, and I take it back to the context of a soldier dressed in the full armor of God, and we need the soldier to be strong, and also determined. How do you do that? How, how, do we, how are soldiers made strong and determined? Isn't it through testing them and, and preparing them and making them ready and whatever it requires, putting them through virtual situations? I'm talking about in the world s- scenario. If we take that for a moment and then we go and we read things like James 1, verse 2 to 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What is he talking about? He's talking about 
uh, a testing brings out a strength, a perseverance. You become equipped. You become empowered. You become strong. So that you lack nothing. Now you've got a situation where the soldier is, where the armor is, the weaponry is fantastic, but so is the soldier. So is the mind of the soldier de determined and strengthened. So is the body of the soldier able to take the weaponry at his disposal, disposal and make it uh, uh, useful for what it was intended to be. Put it to use as it was intended to be. Does this make sense? I trust that as I'm speaking, that for you it's, it's opening up things. Um, testing therefore becomes the next thing which I've, I've just read about. But I was thinking about this when I actually prepared this. <laughs> we don't like testing. We don't like being tested. We... As soon as we get into it, we pray for deliverance from it. But if we understand the context in which James is, is, is referring to and what Paul is talking about with the armor, I, I thought of an aeroplane. Do you know that an aeroplane, you probably do know this, <coughs> I might be stating the obvious, but I'm going to use it as a, an analogy anyway. An aeroplane. Each and every aircraft that you might have seen or you might have traveled on or you might have met people arriving from um, is licensed after having gone through vigorous testing. Now, can you imagine if testing of aircraft wasn't undertaken so that it wasn't required for an aircraft to be tested? You would arrive at the at the gates to get onto the aeroplane and the, the pilot might greet you, whoever would greet you and say, this is a brand new aircraft, brand new out of the box. Um, it was built exactly like all the other ones. So we have every faith that it's going to operate exactly like all the other ones. Would you get on that plane and fly it, for example, to the US, which is an 18 hour flight? Never been off the ground, never taken off. Never had the engines turn, never had the brakes checked or tested, never been through all the electronics on it. I'll tell you what, I was working it out when I actually prepared this. I've done a rough, calcu a rough calculation. I've traveled on international flights, uh, around about 60 international flights over a period of 70, 17 years. At an average flying time per flight of eight hours. So eight hours to a destination and eight hours, about 16 hours per destination and return. Not once, and not once, not even ever once, over a period of 17 years and all that flying, was I ever on an aircraft that picked up a mechanical problem at all, not once. And not that it doesn't happen. We, we've seen what has happened in that industry. But the point is, that wasn't just a one-off chance. I, I got in, in Durban and flew to Joburg and, and the plane worked. No, no, uh, this is repetitive. It tells me a lot about... The testing procedures that those aircraft manufacturers have gone through, that the pilots are confident, strong and resilient to actually fly them for their entire careers. And that is what it is like for the soldier of Jesus Christ. Yes, testing for us is not not a pleasant thing, but it's absolutely essential. Because without it, we don't know where we will f fail on the f in the field or 
where our weaknesses lie or where we perhaps lack faith for something here or we, we can assist another who lacks faith in that area where we can pray in and help them there. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you get the picture. So testing makes a lot of sense on every level. On every level, whether it be in the physical, with aircraft, with anything that's mechanical, also in the spiritual. And we can't take something, you know, following uh, Paul's instruction, we can't take something captive unless we know how. Part of the testing process builds into us the capacity, the understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge on how we take things captive. Look, if we fail, if we fail in the area of, of sins that we continually do repetitively and have given up trying to overcome them or to pursue them or to get through them or to cap take them captive it often leads to feelings of guilt or depression despondency inactivity and it's like taking that coal out of the fire and eventually on its own it, it dies you know it, it, it goes out and gets cold if i just look at hosea hosea 4 Verse 6, and I'm sure you all have heard this or read this at, at some time. God talking to the priests of Israel. My people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge. Sometimes we don't want to know. Sometimes we give up wanting to know. We, we just want to be comfortable and left alone and have this quiet little relationship with God, with, in a beautiful place. The reality is that's not what we've been called to do. Jesus is very clear. He's building his church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. That's not a passive activity. That's a very aggressive and assertive aspect to being Christian. Tear down strongholds. Release captives, heal the sick, undo the work of the devil. That's not something that we are going to be able to achieve, you know, in our, in our comfortable lounge chair. It requires us to be taken back or taken to the kingdom of heaven as many as we can. That means we're going to have to be practiced at what we do. That means... There is going to be testing. That means we will overcome. How do we overcome? Through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> I just think we, should, we can actually just wrap it up there. But I want to finish off with this thing. Romans six nineteen, And I'm going to start halfway through the verse. <clears throat> just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity... And to ever increasing wickedness. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Three words that Jesus has given us in various uh, 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 books of the Bible. You'll know them as soon as I read them. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, that's active, that requires an action. Seek it, seek it, f go find it, look for it, go look for it, go look for it. Requires action. You can't seek the kingdom of God passively on your bed. Mm. Second one. Seek, Jesus again, seek and you will find. So he's now saying... Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now he's saying, seek and you will find. Knock. Third one, knock. Knock. And the door will be open for you. All three of those points require action. To close, I think that, that where we are in our lives determines... And, and Tim used this word, this word, our proximity to Jesus, our revelation of Jesus Christ, 
our revelation of the kingdom of God and how important it is for us to accomplish that which is set out before us, the goals, the purposes, the commission. That is what drives us on to be trained up, even overcoming the personal things in our lives which need to be tackled and dealt with quietly when no one else knows about those things. That's just, just you and God. They need to be taken captive. Why? What is the reason? So that we become um, slaves of righteousness. Just as our God is righteous, our Lord is righteous, we need to pursue righteousness. And I trust that this morning this has been helpful. Please, if there's, I'll say this again, if there's anyone who wants to make contact with, with the church, um, drop us a line. Make contact with your home group. That's for, you, know, you know who your home group leaders are. We look forward to any, any comments that you might have. <laughs> I pray that this word will um, brood in you, will, will bake in you, and that the Holy Spirit will reveal things in you and in me like he's working with me. As I say, I'm not speaking here as someone who's mastered this at all. I'm inclined to speak about the things that I've experienced and am experiencing. And so this is, this is what I felt. If we talk about freedom, we also need to talk about being free from our personal sin that hold us captive. Be blessed this week. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Don't forget... The children's ministry that happens at 2 o'clock this afternoon. You've got your, your children, pull them around, uh, around your computer, your TV at 2 o'clock. There will be a, a ministry time for them. Pray for our leaders of this country. Pray for our leaders in the church. Pray for each other. If you, if you have any prayer requests, as I've said, contact us. Let us stand together with you. And uh, we thank God that we are together with him and that he is with us and we are in him in this time. Be blessed this week. Can I just close with prayer? Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have died as a covenant, as a payment, as an agreement for our sin, that we are released from our sin because of the payment that you have made. Help us, our Holy Spirit, to pursue righteousness in our own personal lives so that we may be that light on a hill, that city on a hill, that light in a dark room, that we may reflect the glory of our Lord and of our God throughout the world. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed. Amen.